Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest uh, careers webinar. We're going to try and guide you around the messy old world of um, motorsport media. And today we're concentrating on photography and we're going to try and give you a real insider's guide as to how you can get a job in photography, what the best tips are. Um, and plenty more, hopefully. Now, there is a poll happening. I will launch the poll. And it just asks you, really, what sort of motorsport photography are you most interested in? Uh, so get involved. Have a go on the poll. Let me know what you're interested in. And as ever, you've got the um, Q&A function uh, and also the chat function. So do feel free to use those as well. We're recording this so that we can put it onto YouTube later on. And if you want to get in touch, you can do it via the hashtag as well, which is MMW 2021. Uh, so it's MMW 2021. If you're doing anything on social media, please use that hashtag if you can. And I have to say a very special thank you to our sponsors. Yes, we have a sponsor. Woo! Uh, New Channel Media are sponsoring us. Uh, they're video production for motorsport, and you can look at their website, which is www.newchannelmedia.com. So thank you to the team there for backing us. Uh, right, let's get on. Hopefully there's lots of you signed on, and uh, we can get our panel to appear as if by magic. Hi, guys. Hey, Jenny. Hi, Hello. Hello, Jenny. Um, so these are our experts I suppose our photographer extraordinaire and uh, we've gone stateside and UK side um, to try and give you as much information as we can um, and I think what I'm going to do is get you guys to introduce yourselves and just tell us a tiny little bit about who you are how you fit into the motorsport world um, and how you started so uh, let's start with Patrick tell us a little bit about yourself hi everyone I'm glad you guys have uh, logged in so my name is Patrick. Uh, I'm a Swedish photographer based in London. I started shooting motorsport back in 2001, doing MotoGP primarily. Uh, did that for 10 years, uh, give or take. And then in 2012, I moved over and started shooting Formula One. And now I do a mixture of everything. I used to follow the series around, but now I'm freelance fully and I'm doing a mixture of a variety of motorsports. Good stuff. And Patrick, how did you begin this crazy journey that you've taken? It, it was quite a strange one, actually. I was started out more as a newspaper photographer. So I was working doing portraiture. I started interning at the independent newspaper in London. That was my first real job after leaving university where I, where I did study photography. And then I just saw an advert actually in the paper for someone looking for a picture researcher working in their, their library. Uh, which was a motorsport agency called Golden Goose. I applied for the job and within one month I was on track shooting. So it was kind of the job description I applied for wasn't that, but within one month I was shooting and then that's how the career started. Amazing. Uh, okay, well, well, obviously there are plenty of questions. Remember, if you've got a question, use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to get your questions into our panel. Um, Glenn, what about you? Hi, uh, well, happy new year to everyone out there. Um, my name's Glenn, based in, in London, UK. Uh, I basically shoot uh, all of the F1 uh, races. Um, I'm contracted to Motorsport Images and I facilitate the contract that they hold with uh, Racing Point, uh, which is now turned into Aston Martin Cognizant Racing, I think. Uh, I should get that name right, really. Um, and be going into the 2021 season being the team's official photographer. Um, my career started uh, really to, to start properly back in about 2002 when I was employed by LAT Photographic. Um, just as a, well, basically what we would call, call them back then was darkroom scumbags. Um, so I see Patrick smiling, you know, it's all about darkroom scumbags, I'm sure. Um, you were there, responsibilities were to process the film, films when the guys come back from the Grand Prix, to do jute pack, to do print runs and all that kind of stuff. Um, luckily at LAT, um, they gave the opportunity to actually go out to the national events around the UK um, and try and be a photographer. Uh, so a couple of bits of touring cars, Formula 3 Championship, British GTs, um, and just try and do more and more and more of that stuff just to get yourself sort of polished as a photographer. 
had an opportunity to photograph the GP2 series, uh, their first ever year back in 2005 um, as their official photographer. And uh, my boss gave me the opportunity then in 2006 to look after the uh, Williams Formula One uh, contract as their official photographer. And so literally I've been a team photographer for my whole career. Um, and that changed uh, in 2019 when we started with Racing Point. Okay, wowzers. Um, next up, let's go stateside. It's incredibly early in the morning, so I really appreciate you joining us. Um, Al, welcome. Hey everybody, um, I'm Al. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in Southern California, but once the race season starts, I'm mostly on the East Coast. Uh, I shoot mainly uh, sports cars like IMSA, uh, IndyCar, um, I kind of shoot just like a little bit of everything. Uh, I do all of Mater Mazda's motorsports uh, photo coverage. And um, I basically, sorry, I'm still waking up. <laughs> um, I, uh, I started, uh, I went to school for photojournalism. I've always loved shooting racing. And basically I started on the other side of the fence, kept shooting, shot in the fan areas managed to convince somebody that I was okay to come to the other side, um, started shooting just a little bit of a time. And uh, I started shooting, I guess I would say professionally about 2005 and then kind of built up from there and got to this point. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you very much. Well, I, there are lots of questions coming in. So uh, keep the questions coming in. If you do want to know something specific uh, from the panel, then use the Q&A function. Uh, last but not least, Josh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Hi there. Um, my name is Joshua Paul. I'm saying hello from Brooklyn, New York, and Happy New Year. Thanks for having me with you all. Um, I actually started as a travel photographer and I shot for adventure travel magazines for about 10 years, kind of going around the world to like the Amazon or the Arctic and kind of crazy destinations. And I stumbled into Formula One by accident. Um, I went to Spain for a month in, uh, let's see, March of 2013, or May, I'm sorry, of 2013, and asked Road and Track to help me get accreditation to shoot the race. I said, I'd be there. If you can help me with the accreditation, I'll shoot for free. And when I got there, <clears throat> it was kind of a perfect storm of events where, um, the FA had thoroughly looked through my website, so they knew who I was, and they actually referred to specific images and um, kind of guided me through the weekend because I didn't know what to do. I'd never been in a media center, never been in a race, didn't know what everyone was doing. Everyone was very busy. I think I sat next to Patrick or across from you, so I was asking for, you know, what do you, how do you get Wi-Fi, for example, or what, you know, what is everyone doing? Or I didn't know the schedule of events, <clears throat> but I had a lot of dumb luck. And part of that was, um, I was a Kimi Raikkonen fan, so I went into Lotus and asked if I could shoot Kimi, and they said yes. And then I went to Ferrari and asked if I could shoot, you know, um, an FP1 or FP2, and they said yes. So my first race, I photographed like Alonso, Massa, Grosjean, Kimi, and had all this material. And um, <clears throat> as I was leaving that weekend, I, I thanked the FAA for the accreditation, and he said, "Come to Monaco. You're here. Come to Monaco." So just, and so they, I had to apply for accreditation on the spot. So before I even entered the paddock, I was applying for accreditation for the next race. And with those images, um, we created a magazine called Lollipop. And it was about the Spanish Grand Prix. And from there, I got permitted accreditation and just changed my life, stopped doing the travel, stopped doing the portraits and joined the F1 Circus with all you guys. Clearly then, you must love it. Otherwise you, you wouldn't have dropped what you were doing. <clears throat> oh, it's amazing, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's hard to figure out what to do at first. And it took me a while to kind of get my bearings and see what everyone was doing. But once I kind of um, relaxed and started shooting F1 like a travel story, it started to come together and then I had a lot to do. And then it was, you know, besides the cars and the drivers, it was um, go meet the mechanics, meet the team principals, meet their wives, meet their kids. And just, it's a family. And that's what was, is amazing to me about Formula One, this huge family. It's not the, I mean, the drivers come and go, teams come and go. The foundation is, is the same. Okay, uh, we're getting some questions coming in, which is good, but I wanted to ask you, because not all of you do Formula One, and I know Patrick, you've gone off into other sports as well now. Do you think trying to get into motorsport photography is particularly difficult, would you say, Patrick? I think it can be. I think there are loads of routes you can go in, as Joshua has just proven. 
I mean, I think the, the most common way of, of getting into Formula One is similar to what Glenn did or what I did. You know, you start out with a picture agency, an established player, and you work your way up from maybe working in the dark room or working with, with the pictures. Uh, I think it is difficult. I think there's loads of different ways you can get in. I think the key things is to start shooting loads. I always get the question, how do you get into motorsport? And I, I always ask, the first question I ask is, are you shooting motorsport now? And quite often people say no. Mm -hmm. And you know, what you need to be doing is you need to be heading out to your local track. You need to be shooting everything you can and getting used to photographing cars or bikes or whatever it is, whatever discipline it is you're interested in. And I think the next step then is to try and build those connections figure out who in your country or where you're based in your country, who are the people who's working at the track, get to know the people. I think that's the way to get in. I mean, you can, you, I know people who've just started shooting themselves, never worked for an agency and going to Formula One. But I think the most common way is through an agency and working your way up slowly. You know, a lot of people like uh, Glenn said, you know, they start as darkroom scumbags. <laughs> you know, when I started out, it was, it was all film. We didn't have digital cameras when I started working. You know, we shot transparencies and, the weekend looked very different to how it looked now. And when you come back from a race, there's hundreds of rolls of films to be developed. So you needed someone to help the guys out because they've just been working for the whole weekend. They've flown back, they've gone straight to the office, got their film developed. You might get a couple of hours sleep and then you're going to start cutting. So, I mean, that's kind of how it uh, used to be and how, how I got into it. So if we don't have that kind of process now with photography, what are the opportunities for youngsters who want to get in, but they can't go into some sort of darkroom environment? Um, I've muted both Glenn and Al, so I'll ask you to unmute yourself when you want to talk. And if you don't want to talk, you can mute yourself as you want. But uh, Glenn, what would be your advice? So the, the role of the darkroom scumbag no longer exists because we don't have film. But... Uh, at Motorsport Images, for example, there is a group of people at the office during the race weekend, and they've kind of taken up the role, but in a digital sense. So we live transmit all our images back to the UK, and then the office pushes them out to our clients, to the website, for numerous overseas uh, publications. Uh, so there's still a way in that way. Uh, you're not handling physical film anymore. You're sitting at a laptop and you're sort of churning through all the stuff we, we are sending back, hopefully polishing it up a little bit, tweaking it a little bit, making our stuff look good, um, and then, then pushing it out. So there has been cases in LAT where there are photographers now that have started that way, and they're up shooting. Uh, we've got a guy called Sam Bloxham. He started that way, but he's shooting um, Formula E now. Uh, another guy, um, Seth Major as well. He started in the office, and now he's, now he's shooting um, Formula One, Formula E, um and and bits and pieces so that there is still a way in by the agencies that way um so that's that's sort of my idea from uh, comparison to how i did it uh luke warmold uh, sorry patrick luke warmold was uh, one of the people that asked this question saying has the landscape changed to get a foot in the door into formula one or is your path uh, into formula one still relevant today no i think the path is still relevant today and what i just wanted to tag on to what Glenn said, which I think is quite an important thing, is that because we are shooting digital now, it is much easier for people in many ways to learn photography. You know, when I was learning photography and I was young and I was a student and you shoot a roll of film, you made sure you had 36 pictures on that roll of film because you couldn't afford to throw loads of film away. So, you know, now you buy a memory card and digital camera, you can take thousands of pictures so your ability to learn and to practice is so much better now than it used to be. You know, when we were starting out, when Glenn was starting out, Joshua was starting out, you, you'd be told by your agency, if you came back with, you know, 150 rolls of film, you needed a certain percentage of those pictures to be good, or you would be told off because it cost a lot of money. So I think the traditional route does work. I absolutely think it does. And I think actually, in some ways, it is easier because you can practice and learn without the added cost that we used to have. Can I jump in real quick just to uh, speak to, so I know you guys did a lot of on the agency side. I actually didn't start out on the agency side. I kind of came in um, basically going to grassroots events, um, putting in FaceTime, uh, finding other photographers and actually just assisting straight for the photographers. Um, so I feel like if trying to get in on the non-agency side, a lot of it is just putting in FaceTime at different events. And I feel like if you come in, at least 
in the States doing SCCA or NASA, there's a lot less limitations as to how you can get in credentials wise. Um, and I think it's a good way to start because you at least get to get trackside, get more images because you can't get better if you're not shooting. And so I would say doing, doing on that end, if you don't want to go the agency route is definitely a way to try it out. You know, also, I think something, uh, oh, sorry, just, 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 okay. real quick, just back to Al's comment. Um, I'm, I went to Sebring as a fan one time and you can stand right on the track and the fence yeah. is maybe, maybe three or four feet high. So you can shoot those cars. And at the time they were still the prototypes. I didn't shoot, we were just, we were more there for the party and the barbecue, but you could put it together portfolio easily. I mean, cars are running all, all the time. There's a different, there are different, such different classes of cars that could look like several races. Mm. And, that, and I, would, I would encourage that as well. I mean, especially if you're in the United States. I think jumping in to what Patrick said now, the ability to be able to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. I think one thing I see quite a lot of people when they question, um, send me questions and stuff on, on social media, um, I seem to critique certain pitches and all the rest of it. They send me some, sometimes some really nice stuff. But what I always go back to is, can you do the basics? Because mm. I think a lot of people see Instagram now and they see us not, you know, we're producing these creative artistic images, but we can still go back and shoot the basics time and time and time and time again. And that's how we've got to where we are today. And then that's how we've been able to have the ability to go and experiment and practice. If you can't shoot the basics, you're not going to get anywhere. So it's so important to learn those steps. Okay, so from an outsider's point of view, what are the basics, Glenn? Talk us through if you're, you know, maybe you're doing uh, GCSEs or you're at school at the moment, what are the basics that you need to be able to do? Um, basics when it comes to action sports photography uh, for, for racing cars is to be able to get a, a sharp head-on shot uh, of any and every car that's going past you, a sharp pan shot, show movement in the image as well, but not massive movement, just show that it's actually moving on the circuit and hasn't frozen in time, and a front three quarter. If you can nail those every single time the car comes around, you can move on to the next step and then push your creativity and see what you can do past that. But if you can't nail those, I don't think any client would take you particularly um, seriously. Um, and even your creative stuff you do, you have to be able to nail that time and time again. There's no point standing at a corner and you get this fantastic shot of, say, Valtteri. And say, for example, in some world, Mercedes go, we love that shot you did of Valtteri. Can you get one of Lewis? And you can't, because that's just a one off. Is this consistency? And going back to what Patrick said, now we're shooting digital. It gives us this great opportunity to get that consistency going. And I think that's a very important thing for anyone starting out in this game mm -hmm. to be consistent in their abilities and to be able to reproduce the stuff that they, they show um, online all the time. I think what Glenn's making is a really good point. I, I see that's the one negative I see with digital is that a lot of people. They don't learn the basics and they cover up their mistakes by editing and things like that. And, you know, they'll get a picture, they'll shoot a really wide picture and they come home and they'll crop it and they'll frame it the way they want to. And then they'll, you know, spend a lot of time in Lightroom or Photoshop and tinkering with the shot. Whereas actually, if you're shooting at a Formula One race, we're not allowed to do editing. You can do very, very minimal editing. And also, like Glenn says, he doesn't edit his own picture. He sends it off to the office and that's what we used to do. Uh, so you, the picture that you take needs to be as close as to the finished result as you, you know, possibly can get so that when the editor in London, who has no idea what was in your head or you were thinking, can edit that picture to the way you want it to be. And I see a lot of younger people who not, they haven't learned the basic techniques of photography. They don't understand the basics, the very, very basics of photography. And I think that digital is partly to blame for that. And I think that's really important, like learn basic photography. When I did my first degree, we were given one of the uh, challenges we were given, we were given a roll of 24 film. And they asked us to go out and get 24 portraits of people we didn't know. So you got a roll of 24 and you have to get 24 good portraits. And that, I think you should think like that even when you shoot digital. Every frame you take should be a good frame. You know, it should be a good shot. You shouldn't have to be tinkered with when you come home. You should understand what you're doing and really think about the shot you're making. Um, interestingly, Mick Palmer has been in touch on the Q&A function and he says, how important is the ability to edit with Photoshop or Lightroom? And I suppose what you guys are saying is actually the editing part isn't really your job. Uh, I think it depends in, in kind of what 
sense in how you shoot for for agency photographers uh not so much we do edit our own stuff and we can and and we do like to edit our own stuff because we put the finishing touches but uh maybe uh, joshua or, or al can can take that up because my side of things is like yeah the quick process the quick uh working schedule of getting it back so for me yeah my photo shop skills aren't that great to say the least uh, but i don't know if, if joshua or al can pick that up not being not being agency I think it's actually really important to have Photoshop or Lightroom skills, especially getting your process down, doing it quickly, making sure that everything you want to do is kind of spot on, um, especially with the kind of turnaround time you need to have nowadays. Uh, I work really hard to kind of hone that. And I, I think there is that need absolutely to kind of hone in and making sure you have those basics in the camera but I definitely shoot alongside a couple of photographers that I think when they're shooting, they have their edit and their post-process in mind. So what they get out of the camera might actually look different than when, or pretty different than what, what they get when they are done with post-production, but that's just their mindset and how they produce it. So it's almost like a different kind of photography where they, they start out knowing what they want at the end product, but the end product is coming out of basically the computer. Going back to Patrick, I mean, I think we have to know how, to, how a camera works. And I shoot with manual cameras and I choose a shutter speed and an aperture. And I work, I work from either one of those angles. If I want to shallow depth of field and I'm going to shoot 2.8, then I don't have the, a lot of options with the shutter speed. If I want blur, I don't have a lot of options with the, with the aperture. But I understand the camera so well that it's intuitive to just make those decisions. And that's where digital can be set on auto and you, know, you can just shoot. And in fact, my first race, I shot, I think, five or 6,000 frames. And I was just excited to have an F1 car captured. And I had to get over that. It took me a few races to get over the fact that, okay, now you've shot these F1 cars, but it's not Lewis, it's not you know, the top driver, it's just any car. And I had to now start being more specific about that. Um, and now I shoot less on purpose. I don't shoot if it's a crappy shot or I'll I might walk into the track, but the light's better over there. So I'll just walk back and sacrifice that half an hour, but I'll get good frames. And you know, when you're shooting it, it's, and you feel it, it's just like, okay, this is working. It's, you know, it's, and a lot of times it doesn't work. Um, Ali, just re regarding shooting, I mean, I envision my shots all the time and it might not be capturing the camera because with digital camera, if you're gonna look at your, I don't look at my monitor either. I just stopped doing that a long time ago. I just shoot, shoot, shoot. Then when I get back into the media center, then I'll look at the film or the images because otherwise it's just too distracting or you think you got it and you walk away. But I do envision the shot and if I see clouds and I know they can come in, I'll burn that in a little bit. I'm not afraid of that. And it's expressive. It's to, it's to differenti differentiate my style of photography from someone else's. Because you know, it's really easy for all of us to have the exact same camera, same lenses. Um, another thing is I use uh, manual focus lenses. I use Zeiss lenses and old vintage Nikon lenses and they're beautiful because they don't filter out all the color. They, don't, they, they, let the, they, they allow lens flare and all the things that are supposed to be bad but to me, it's just very expressive and it gives it kind of a vintage, timeless look. With editing, I think because Glenn and I come, you know, quite a lot from an editorial background or, or working for a, a news agency. And when you work for an agency, you not, I mean, there's very little you're actually allowed to do because you can't change the picture, which is why a lot of what work we do at a track, we can't do that much Photoshop or Lightroom. But like Al says, it's really important, obviously, to have a quick workflow because we do pump a lot of images out. And what I've noticed the big difference when I, left doing Formula One full time, and I'm now working for clients like Red Bull and people like that, where I have complete freedom to my editing. Then you edit in a very different way. And I can, I'm allowed, you know, to burn a sky in, or I'm allowed to remove something in the background that I hate, you know, whereas in Formula One, if I take a picture and there's a sign there and I'm very picky, I'm not, I'm not allowed to, move, to remove that. That's not editorially correct. Whereas if I'm shooting for a commercial client, I can then look at it very differently. Like Al said, you know, then you can look at something and think, well, I can't take that picture now, but I can come home and I can, you know, add this and I can remove that. It's a very different thought process. And it's quite, I think it's important to know who you're shooting for when you're shooting, because then you can readjust kind of your parameters. 
Um, Emile's has got in touch saying, and this is, this is kind of apt for you because I all feel like you're in very different places, but maybe I'm wrong. But what camera would you suggest uh, to get when starting your career in motorsport photography? And what cameras do you use now? And I'll go to Joshua first because you have the most, I suppose, eclectic mix of um, cameras. I could be wrong, but I'm guessing. No, no, so I shoot with an Nikon D850 and it's, um, it's, it's, has the highest resolution of any digital camera that I can find. And I have the original Nikon lenses from the 80s when I started shooting, so they still fit, they still, the mount never changed. So I have that, I have one camera body, those lenses. Um, I take a, a Nikon 105 generally, and just kind of make the app, the focal length work for me. So I don't shoot long lenses. I don't, I, I don't really compress my frame. I'll just, you know, walk the track to make the lens work. Um, my second season, I started shooting with the 1913 4x5 Graflex camera, which is a single lens reflex. And I can shoot uh, 20 frames at a time. I have 10 plates that hold two pieces of film on each side. So uh, I didn't have a lot of success the first season. Um, it was hard to focus and I was trying to shoot action, which is impossible because I have two shutter speeds. Um, one's a 30th of a second, one's a 60th of a second. That's because the camera's just so old it has two at work. But I started shooting the pit lane more and more um, mechanics and portraits and drivers and kind of found my niche in that where it's more intimate, more of a, a approach of taking portraits and, and documenting Formula One without really showing the race, at least with that camera. And then I'll go and shoot the race with the, with the digital and um, they're very different, but I mean, it's, it, it keeps it interesting throughout the weekend. When I come home with um, all the film and start the dark room, what's, the, what's the name again? Sorry. <laughs> I'm that dark room guy basically developing the film and processing the film and then scanning for a couple weeks after each race. You are the dark room scumbag of your own world. Keeping it, yeah, I am. I smell the D76 in the air. Um, Glenn, let's come to you next. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of pushing into the rounds of, of mirrorless. I've played around with the Sony A9 and A9 Mark II for a bit. Um, uh, kind of didn't really go the Sony way. So uh, at the moment, and for this year, or well, half this year, I ran the uh, Canon R5 with a couple of the RF lenses, which are the lenses specifically made for Canon's new mirrorless system. Alongside that, I'm still shooting with two 1DX Mark IIs, um, just because they're great, great solid um, Canon versions of their top um, uh, DSLRs. For starting off, I would suggest to go for a, I'm, I've lived Canon all my life, so, I'm not sure about Nikon. Nikon is very good as well, and so is Canon. But for me, I know more about Canon. I'll, I'll suggest something like a Canon 80D if you're starting off. It's a little bit pricier than the entry level, but then it will give you the scope to do to do a lot of stuff with rather than getting, I suppose, restricted by a very cheap entry level DSLR. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say something like a, an 80, Canon 80D or D80, 80D, 80D, yeah. Al, what do you reckon? Uh, I agree with Glenn. I shoot Canon also, um, and it's. I think it's a perfect starter camera. Uh, I shoot um, two one DX Mark IIs and one Mark One while I wait for my mirrorless to come in. <laughs> um, slow going. Uh, I definitely feel like mirrorless, at least trackside, is a is a good for the future. Um, but it's it definitely has more development that needs to come in before you can really trust it. But in the meantime, the 1DX, I, I love them. They're workhorses. They they do an awesome job. Yeah. And now, I suppose, big drum roll moment. Um, Patrick, are you a uh, Nikon guy or are you a Canon guy? Are you somewhere in the middle? Does that even happen? Do you have to pick yeah. one or the other? Uh... Well, so I, I've been both. So in the early days, the digital cameras kept leapfrogging each other. So Canon was better, then when Nikon was better, and then Canon was better. Uh, so I, I swapped and changed as the cameras were, you know, at their best. I think now it really doesn't matter. You shoot Nikon, you shoot Canon, they're both really good. It comes down to personal preference. How do you like your camera to work? Uh, at the moment, I'm shooting Nikon and I have done for maybe six or seven years now. Uh, and I think it's interesting, like Glenn said, the mirrorless. I mean, I'm shooting with the Z7 now, which is a, a mirrorless, which I think is really interesting. I've also got the D850, which I think is an absolutely astounding camera. Uh, very, very good. And for workhorses, I used the D5. The D6 has just come out. 
But I think one of the things, I, I get this question as well a lot, what camera do you use? And I think people focus a lot on the camera. Yes, you need a decent camera to take pictures, but you, you know, that's not, shouldn't be the focus. You know, the camera you have now, you know, and go out and take pictures. I see a lot of people say, oh, well, I'll go and shoot motorsport when I've got this camera. You can shoot motorsport with anything. You know, you can shoot motorsport with your phone. You can shoot motorsport with whatever you want. The important thing is like take pictures, but um, obviously something where you can control your shutter speed, your aperture, where you can change the lenses would be the ideal starter. I don't actually know what the entry Nikon would be, but you know, something like, or even getting a second hand D4 or something like that might be a, a good option. But uh, you know, I don't think you should focus, when you learn, when you're starting out, I wouldn't focus too much on the equipment. You know, go to the track, you know, shoot, shoot with what you have. Like Joshua says, you mainly shoot with one lens. You know, you don't need every lens from, you know, 60 mil to 600 mil to go to shoot F1. You can shoot it with what, what you have now, and then you can sort of build over time. Um, so just, just added that, just quick tip, never ever buy a second-hand camera that a motorsport <laughs> photographer has owned. We <laughs> yeah. use them, we what? use them, just <laughs> account is high, so stay away from those. Go for a second-hand camera that a studio photographer used, not a second-hand uh, motorsport photographer's camera. That's you know, back to what Patrick said, I mean, I agree. I mean, if you, I mean, we shoot great shots for iPhones, you know, all the time, and often I have both cameras, I'll shoot it with the iPhone instead of my camera, and I'll sometimes regret it. But we're photographers, and I think if you have something to say, you'll be able to express that with any camera. You know, find a camera that fits your hands. I mean, for me, not, I've had Nikons and I had the lenses, so I bought one because a friend had one. When I get a Canon, it doesn't, it's not as intuitive for me, but I know it's a probably a superior camera. I mean, for optically and, and you know, for, for speed and frame rate. But um, get a camera that you feel comfortable with. It's, it's, it's like, a, it's, it's your expression. I mean, that's what I would say. Uh, I, I think it should be an extension of your body, basically. You Absolutely. should never think. And that's why me growing up Canon, for me, it's going to always be Canon because yeah. it's intuitive for yourself with Nikon. It's just an extension of your body and you can just use it quickly and you know what every dial and every button does and it adds to your workflow and adds to your, your uh, outfit at the end of the day. You know, can I add something too? Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Canon, Nikon and now Sony support Formula One races. So they come with thousands of pounds of gear to every race. So I can we can test any camera, any lens, essentially. I mean, as a Nikon shooter, there's Patrick and a couple other guys that shoot Nikon. So we can, we have access to those camera bodies and, you know, different focal lengths. So I will go take a long lens to go play, but it's, um, it's great to have that access. And, and same for you, Glenn, right? I mean, you have that access to all this gear, which is a huge yeah, luxury. Yeah, no, Canon support at the Formula One is great. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, 2020 didn't happen because of COVID. They mm -hmm. weren't allowed in. Uh, but yeah, every year since I've been in Formula One, Canon has been there, and so has Nikon from Nikon users. Sony are just getting into it themselves. Um, but the support we get from the, our camera manufacturers at Formula One is they fix our cameras if they break, for example, give it a good cleaning, yeah. and the camera's filthy after an F1 race. If you're changing lenses on track, I mean, it's you're gonna have debris in your lens on your mirror, no, no question about it. I think for even people who are want to be up and comers and can't even afford a camera. Uh, with my iPhone, I basically did a project where for two years I took photos with my iPhone. I took it to the track. You can pan with it, like buy a polarizer and maybe, you know, and <laughs> throw it over the cover on the, on the camera on your iPhone. You can pan with it, put it in portrait mode, take pictures of drivers, like, as, or as close as you can get. Like, there's a lot that you can do with very little even if you don't have the ability to get your hands on a camera, just try your hand at it. Right, I'm gonna try and crack through some more of these um, questions because lots of you are getting in touch. Thank you so much. Um, and well, what we can't answer on the webinar, we'll try and answer afterwards. I'll give the guys some homework to do. Um, right, Paul Hayburn says, is being a motorsport photographer a young person's game or is age irrelevant? Joshua, can you take that one for us? I started when I was 45. So I felt like it was almost a new beginning to me because I'd shot a di completely different subject for so long. I don't think it's, a, I mean, I think it actually keeps me young because it keeps you fit. So we're walking sometimes 20 kilometers a day. Like Monaco, it's 20 kilometers a day, every day. And you stay fit, you eat well, um, drink, I mean, five, 10 liters of water a day. I mean, if you're in good shape and you want to do it, do it, but you have to take care of yourself. And it's, it's demanding and you need certain, but I, um, I had tendonitis for a year from, from holding a lot from a, holding a heavy lens. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's 
necessarily young or old. I would say younger person's game, but you can do it if you have something to say. Um, and Al, being, I'm going to, it's, you know, an obvious question, the only female on our panel, and you do not see a lot of female photographers, whether it be F1, any of the motorsports I've worked in, which is a lot, because I'm old. Um, so how tough is it to break in if you're a female? And, and what are the challenges to being a female photographer in motorsport? Uh, I think I'm, I mean, I don't know as much about the limitations. A lot of what I did was just basically coming in as a photographer, first and foremost, um, having the knowledge, know the technical side, and basically just working as, as that, as part of the motorsports world. And uh, I, I'm lucky because a lot of the people that I work with, they, I don't think they see me as much as a female, but basically just a fellow photographer. <laughs> um, it may have given me a leg up. I may, it may have hindered me. I actually, I don't really know, um, which I think is, I'm kind of lucky to have that ability, um, but basically just making sure that I do what I need to do. Don't try to, you know, be dramatic, I guess. And then, <laughs> and just work hard and be good alongside the other people I'm working with. Yeah, I think uh, as, as a female in motorsport, you're always going to be slightly in the minority um, and you just get on with it because that's what we do. Um, Baptiste has been in touch and a lot of you actually have been in touch to talk about work experience, um, portfolios, how to network and, and especially in COVID times, it's really difficult for anybody who's trying to break into anything anywhere. Um, so Baptiste says, uh, what is the best way to try and get work experience and, and to gain experience and reach out to, to people to try and get a job? Um, so Patrick, let's start with you, if you wouldn't mind trying to answer that one. I, I think it's quite a tricky question, actually. I mean, I, it goes back to a little bit what I said before. It is networking. It's like Al said, you know, go to your local events. There will be at most local events in the UK are representative from some of the big agencies. They might just be a photographer, they might be, you know, someone at the team, but there will be someone that you can start networking with. That's one way. The other way is to constantly contact the agencies. And I know you probably, you'll probably send hundreds of emails and you won't get a response, but you, if you're persistent over a long period of time and you keep going to the events, eventually you'll meet the right person. You meet that person you've been trying to email and then you can say, you know, I've been trying to reach out to you. Uh, I'm really interested in working with you. It's about being persistent. It's about thinking outside the box. You know, is there an event in your town or they're doing a Formula One exhibition? Who's going to be there? Try and turn up, try and find the person that potentially runs that agency or is in charge of that team. Because it, it is hard. I mean, it's hard for established photographers to get into Formula One. It is a tough industry, but it's not impossible, but you have to work hard and you have to sort of try and yeah, be creative in how you approach people. I just echo what Patrick said there, really. It's, it's bloody tricky. Um, you know, sort of for myself, it kind of just happened. I know that's not any advice anyone can pick up on, but I think everyone's story, how they got into motorsport photography is different. And it is trying all the routes. And it's persistence. Because from when I was um, full-time agency, I'm three months now, when I was full-time agency, I realised that, you know, the agency was full of photographers. There weren't any gaps, there weren't any spaces. So you could send an email if you're trying to get in one week, don't get any reply. But again, if you try a few months later, there might be an opportunity there that opens up and it is being proactive. Um, and it's having, I think, the right mentality just to keep on plodding the way. But when you do get there, it's having the right mentality to stay there. And I have plenty of photographers that haven't managed that because it's, it's long hours, it's antisocial, it's a lot of travel, it's a lot of being away. So you got to really think to yourself, great, I want to be a motorsport photographer, but am I happy to miss birthdays, to miss weddings, to miss special occasions? Because that's what's going to happen. We've sacrificed all of us, have sacrificed a lot of our personal life to be where we are. So you got to really think, yeah, this is something I want to do and be a bit belligerent about it and a bit, be a bit stubborn, but just keep on plodding away. Like Patrick said, keep on trying keep on trying and get that practice in as well. I think also don't discount the use of social media, um, yeah. especially, especially in this day and age. It's do the cold calls, do the cold emails, but if you get a shot that you think's killer, put it up and tag the 
you know, tag the people in it, whoever's in it, whatever series, whatever driver, get it out there. You know, also once you, once you get in, <clears throat> I still carry a portfolio with me and it weighs about 50 pounds, but I have a huge 20 by 24 inch portfolio of, of current shots, mostly black and white with the old camera. But I go and have meetings where I leave it with the team. I'll leave it at Mercedes. I mean, we know each other, but it's still just remind them that remind them of what you do. Cause no one, they're not going through your Instagram. I mean, you think, I mean, I get, you'll, you'll get the likes and you'll get the people see it, but Lewis isn't going through your Instagram feed. So remind them of what you're doing, showing that it's unique, showing what you, you, there's a reason you're there. That's why I think it's, do you want to be a photographer? Show how much you want to be a photographer. I mean, work, work very hard and try to have a point of view that you stand out and people say this, this person's amazing. Like bring them in and it might be like I, for my magazine, I want to bring in food photographers cause they shoot still life so beautifully. Like I would love to see them photograph a car while it's parked or in the garage. I mean, think outside the box. It's not just, I mean, I've always loved cars and, but this came to me way later in life. I never imagined I'd be here. But when I got there, I took advantage of every second of the day. I mean, first one there, last one to leave. Like, like these, all these people here, I mean, we're all the same. That's why we're successful. Um, Tyler's been in touch uh, and a, a few of you actually have been in touch to just ask about workflow. Um, so could you, before we wrap up, because we're almost out of time, can you just give some advice to people? How do you manage workflow? How do you process so many photos so quickly? Al, do you want to start on this one? Because you spoke about workflow. Yeah, I would say basically it's just trial and error. Um, time, learning what works best for you, what doesn't, even down to, you know, how you your folder process, choosing if you want to do things in photo mechanic, Lightroom, and basically, like I said, like just create a first rough draft structure, go off of that, and then see if you can cut down time by changing one other thing and keep, keep trying it that way. I, I just I think it's quite, it's very personal. And like Glenn says, a lot of the time now at an F1 race, we don't actually process our own pictures. They, we send, we sort of have we have transmitters on our cameras and we send straight to either someone at the track or someone in an office. But I think, yeah, it's absolutely about structure. If you're doing it yourself, you need to know, you need to have a folder structure and you need to have a workflow that you, you know, developed over time and not everyone's is the same. So what works for me might not work for Joshua or Al. So it's not like a straightforward thing, but I think work coming up with a really structured system that works for you and then loads of automation you know automation uh shortcuts so that you know when you import your pictures into your camera they already have all the information about the event you know in the ibtc they already have all the information you've already named them you've already labeled them you've already positioned them so that you you know you're doing as much as you can automatically so you don't have to do as much manually but it is about trial and error i mean i like Al, I use photo mechanic when I have to edit myself. I find it very quick. Other people work with Lightroom. So, you know, we're all, we're all different. Be prepared. You show up with your laptop, you plug everything in, you have hard drives, you have a separate hard drive, the card reader ready to go. And when you get off the track, go right to the media center, download those cards, try to squeeze in a, a, a quick bite if you can. You come back and basically get the cameras, get the cards and go back out on circuit. There's not a lot of time. So it's mostly about just preparation. Go if you are, you know, go on Wednesday and Get everything set up, you're ready to go. You have your space and it's just this Zen process of being ready. And then it's suddenly Sunday night and you're heading home. When you say Zen, it makes me laugh because you're absolutely right. In any of the motorsport big press centers that I've been to in the past, you get these kind of banks of computers. You, you all take your own computer. And the photography section, because normally all the photographers sit together, all the journalists sit together, and then the online guys sit together. That's always the most chilled place in the media center, all the photographers have their banks of whatever they need to do. And you go over there and it's just like, oh, these are relaxed people. But actually it's just because you're all organized, I think. That's what it comes down to. We're all disorganized as journalists. I would say relaxed. <laughs> yeah, I think we all just internalize it and we're all just freaking out inside. <laughs> <laughs> you just summed up every single press center I've ever been to. In F1, races, in F1 race is a countdown or any, any race is a countdown. It's just like, it just starts ticking away. And if you didn't get it that session, you try the next one. The next one, suddenly it's, you know, it's the, it's the qualifying in the race, you know, qualifying is only an hour and you just suddenly like, okay, did I shoot anything this weekend? You know? So it's, yeah, it's very, very internalized for sure. 
Um, we did run a poll at the beginning of this session, so thank you to everybody who took part. Um, and just asking which sort of discipline of motorsport photography you were most interested in. Um, the most is online uh, photography at 70 percent. Uh, then you've got journalism. Oh, it's changing. People are voting. How rude. Um, journalism at 51 percent. Newspaper and magazine, 43 percent. Book 16, other nine. Uh, so thank you to everybody who got um, involved in that. I just want to end things by really asking each of you for one one piece of advice. If you can make it different from the person who's just been, that would be even better. But what's your one kind of takeaway for people who have been watching this in order for them to succeed? Uh, you can pick whatever you want. Um, and let's start with Al. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's like really early where you are and I've picked on you. <laughs> um, I think basically what all of us have said uh, quite a few times, which is you can't take good pictures if you just don't keep shooting. You just shoot everything. It doesn't, if you're not at the track, you can shoot, you can shoot your dog, you can shoot a lamp, just keep taking pictures, make them look better. You can't get better if you're not working. And so just consistently keep trying. Mm -hmm. Try do things, try stupid things. Try things you know won't work and try to make those better. Um, Al, can you just tell people what your Instagram is, please, so that they can have a look at your work? Uh, I'm Ignite Media Photo. Um, I would say just, just you know, utter determination. If you, if you want to be a photographer, you'll be a photographer. And when I went to art school 20 years ago, people said, oh, that's a tough gig. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I, I think I can do it. And if you want to be in motorsport, you'll find your way into motorsport. So go to those races, keep shooting. And, you know, like Al said, sh just shoot, shoot, shoot. Have a camera with you. Don't be lazy. Um, you'll find your way there, you know. If you want it bad enough, you'll find your way there. There are a million types of motorsport as well. And even if you do want to work in, let's say, F1, MotoGP, whatever it may be, get yourself to IndyCar and the Indy 500. You've got to start at some level which is probably more basic and work your way up very few people do what josh did and basically walk into an f1 paddock and carve out a career is that, is that fair to say josh oh it's just i went to go see a rock concert in spain i had no i had no intention of shooting a race so yes absolutely um, glenn what's your take home for people oh josh i didn't ask you um instagram what if people want to see your work mine's lollipop magazine perfect uh glenn I would say um, enjoy it because you're going to have to enjoy it because if you make this your career and you don't enjoy it, you're not going to last very long. You're not going to have fun. I've always said after doing this for X amount of years and having a, a young family at home, the day that I'm not looking forward to going to the first Grand Prix of the year is the day I'm going to stop and I'm still looking forward to it and I still enjoy it. So I think no matter where you are in your career path, no matter what you're doing, no matter if you're standing at a soggy corner at Donington Park and it's five degrees and pissing with rain just gotta make sure you enjoy it because if you don't have a look around at what else there is to do uh, enjoy it would be my my bit to take away from it and Patrick oh Glenn sorry so, I forgot Instagram, Instagram websites whatever you want <laughs> uh my Instagram is my name uh, which I think you can see see that somewhere uh, <laughs> but just underscore uh, in between uh, Glenn underscore Dunbar is my Instagram. Lovely, thank you. Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I think actually what Glenn touched on is a really important point there, that, you know, you, if you, you have to enjoy it, and it is hard work, you know, it looks very glamorous, you look from the outside, it looks like the most glamorous job in the world, but it is really hard work, and you've got to be very passionate about it if you're going to commit to shoot a race series with everything that comes with that. I think in terms of advice, for me, the, the key thing that I see that is the difference between the people who are really successful in Formula One or, or MotoGP is the people who are prepared. You know, the, so I, even though I've been doing F1 for many years, I still walk every single circuit before the weekend. I walk the track and I go and look at new angles. I go and try and find new shots. So I think that, that my advice would be always try and find something new. Always think. What can I do that the other guys are not doing to make my photography that little bit better? And, you know, if that means that you've got to, even if you've been to the track 15 times, you still go and you walk around the track because they might have moved an arm curve area or a tree might have grown or, you know, that, that extra, go that extra mile to try and get a shot that other people aren't getting. You know, in Formula One, there's like 90 incredibly talented photographers. So how are you going to stand out? So, you, you know, you need to think about that and think about how I'm, pushing more than the other guys 
so that you know my images are, are visible. Uh, and if people want to see your work, Patrick. So my Instagram is my name, Patrick Lund Photo. Uh, right, I think that's all we've got time for. We could have gone on forever. There are lots of uh, questions still there, so I might get, as I said, the team to have a look at them. Um, Patrick, Glenn, Al, Josh, thank you so much for being in the webinar and for giving your expertise to the people watching. Hopefully, it's helped to inspire you at home, may give you, maybe give you an idea of what you can do to get yourself into a paddock somewhere, um, or even if it's just as Al said, shooting your dog or a lampshade, just start, <laughs> get going, get taking pictures and fingers crossed one day I will be bumping into you in a paddock somewhere in the world hopefully you've enjoyed it again thank you very much to our new sponsors uh, new channel media check out their website and check out everybody else's Instagram as well because it seems to me like Instagram is a great tool for photographers in general mm -hmm. I think yep. so yeah. <laughs> right. So from everybody here, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for your time. Uh, all that's left for us to do is say um, bye for now. So for everybody here, bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Bye, bye. Thank you guys.